Good evening, everyone. I'm Dennis Stone, Director of the Center for Advocacy and Social Justice. And with us tonight uh, is Isis Alvarez from the Not-for-Profit Center, Not -for -profit Center at, in Jacksonville. And we're really excited about her program tonight. She'll be addressing inequitable systems in the nonprofit sector and reflecting on really the challenges the nonprofit sector has when it comes to uh, equality. And uh, we've been talking before we got started about some suggestions she has for uh, handling these issues. Hopefully she'll share her, not only what she does, but also some of her personal background and as these conversations are designed to, um, as a people to people program. Uh, so with that, um, Ms. Alvarez, if you wouldn't mind giving us some of your background and starting your presentation. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Dennis. Good evening, everybody. Um, can everyone see me? Can I get some thumbs yes. up? Awesome. Thank you. Um, so yes, yeah, so um, I am here tonight to talk a little bit about um, the nonprofit center um, where where I work, um, the work that we're doing um, within our space to address um, uh, the kind of barriers and systems that are stopping what we feel is the nonprofit sector from really becoming a healthier workforce and more impactful, um, and talk some about kind of how we've been approaching that. So um, my name is Isis Alvarez. I am a program director at the Nonprofit Center. Um, I've been at the Nonprofit Center for about 10 years. Um, I, before that, um, I, I joined actually fresh out of college. I went to Florida State University. Um, at Florida State, I'm, I'm originally from Caracas, Venezuela. I moved here when I was uh, six years old. Um, and um, Originally, when I was at Florida State, I wanted to go to law school, and I very quickly became pretty heavily involved in activism, um, and that completely changed the trajectory of my life in a really wonderful way. Um, I was involved with a group called the Dream Defenders um, in, in Tallahassee, um, if you're all familiar. Um, we uh, um, occupied the Florida State Capitol for... 30, 31 days um, after the acquittal of George Zimmerman. And it really, um, like I said, added a whole new element to how I viewed um, public service and kind of my role in being an agent for change. Um, and then I moved to Jacksonville after I graduated, uh, became an intern at the nonprofit center, and they never let me leave. Um, so I've had the privilege of wearing a lot of hats at the nonprofit center, um, but predominantly I've spent a lot of my time um, thinking through how we better serve um, community-based grassroots organizations and really improve all of our offerings to be more inclusive and welcoming to all people. Um, and uh, I, I did take two years off um, from my work at the nonprofit center to be a stay-at-home mom. So I have a two and a half year old here. So if you hear screaming, that is what that is. Um, but ever since I've come back um, earlier this year, I've been working on a few projects. So I also lead our work with the LGBTQI plus community. I do an emerging leaders program for the LGBTQI plus um, young professionals in the nonprofit sector, as well as um, looking at um, shared services for nonprofits. So we've been doing um, some models around how we can provide creative solutions to organizations, especially smaller organizations. Um, and I'm gonna talk about some other programs. Um, and I'm gonna be looking at the chat um, but if anyone has any questions, I think we're a small enough group. Just come off mute and interrupt me. I'd love for this to be a conversation and discussion. So, um, yeah, feel free to, to, to interrupt me at any moment because I'll just kind of keep talking. Um, so a little bit about us at the Nonprofit Center. We are a membership-based organization. We are a 501c3. Unlike other organizations, we don't work directly with community members. The way that we support um, Northeast Florida is by supporting other organizations. So the way that we do that is we provide uh, resources, trainings. We do a lot of research that I'll talk about in a little bit. 
Um, and we also offer a lot of different things that I have listed here. If you work for a nonprofit or if you um, are a volunteer or a board member, or if you're interested in becoming a board member, I'd highly recommend checking out our website and the link is down below. So um, this is our um, kind of philosophy of of work, um, we like to really address it at the top of any um, presentation. Um, the nonprofit center has been around for about 20 years. Um, we were created by um, the Community Foundation and the Jesse Bell DuPont Fund. And really the philosophy was to create a support system for nonprofits. Um, and this is really how we think about um, supporting nonprofits. And these are the different four pillars that we think organizations need to be um, well versed in and strong in to have a high impact. And so those four pillars are high performing leadership teams, organizational learning and impact measurement, access to capital and external awareness and advocacy. And again, if you're interested in more of our philosophy of change and our theory of work, you can um, go to our website. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the nonprofit centers journey. Um, and it's been a long one, especially when we look at um, our equity journey. So as I mentioned, the Nonprofit Center has been around for 20 years. And in that time, we've amassed a lot of expertise, a lot of um, quote unquote best practices. Um, and about five to six, seven years ago, we really started to have serious conversations about um, who we were um, and who did we represent? Right. And so when we think about who our membership base was, it wasn't really representative of all of the nonprofits in Northeast Florida. And we call, our, call ourselves the Nonprofit Center of Northeast Florida. But in reality, we were looking at the United Ways, the YMCA's, the Big Brothers, Big Sisters. And we really knew at the end of the day that didn't encompass or really represent everyone that was on the ground doing the work. Um, we also looked at who we want to be and what our weak points are. So we looked at um, what did we see as being issues that were on the horizon um, for the sector and where were we ill-equipped to meet those um, needs. And so through those conversations, we really identified three priority focus areas. So the first is expanding who um, was a part of our network and who we identified as a part of our network to more accurately reflect not only the demographics of Jacksonville, but also accurately reflect the nonprofit sector of all different sizes. Um, we wanted to invest into our infrastructure and capacity um, before we started thinking about being it, creating resources around equity. Um, we really wanted to ensure that we were practicing what we preach. Um, and then once we kind of had that, we knew that we really needed to start um, getting resources out into the community as quickly as possible. And I talk about this because I think it's important for organizations to be transparent and talk about what these journeys look like, um, because it really, I believe, demystifies the process and um, makes it more okay to talk about that it's a journey, right? It's not a, a box you check that you're an equitable organization. It's really a constant process of, of growth. Any questions before I move on? Okay, awesome. So first we looked at our internal capacity building. So, um, and this is interesting. So we know back in 2020, everyone was creating these DEI statements, right? Everyone was, was making these statements around, they were equity champions and all of this. And, and then in 2024, it looks a lot different of who still has those statements up and who's still doing that work. And so for us, it was really important to not only make a statement, but to make a commitment, um, a, a kind of um, continuous investment into this work to ensure that this isn't something that we're investing into because the political winds are in its favor, but because we know it's um, the right thing to do, but also because it's integral into the success of, of not only us, but the sector as a whole. Um, and you can actually find that that statement on our website. Um, and, and we also wanted to be clear about what we said. Um, so and what we didn't say, right, there's a lot of organizations that 
today do not use terms such as racial equity or white supremacy. Um, and so for us, it was really important to ensure that we were being explicit and clear about um, what we wanted to address. Um, and then we really looked at some of our internal practices and protocols through audits. And so we audited our HR systems, our programming, our communications, our physical space, as well as our website, our membership structure. And we really looked at how much of this is equitable, how much of this is accessible, um, and really started to look at, um, again, as I mentioned earlier, cleaning house and ensuring that before we started making all of these resources for the external community, we were really um, ensuring that we were practicing that. Um, and of course, ongoing board and staff uh, learning and trainings, that is a constant for us. Um, and then we really developed a model um, for transparent um, and constant communication around our journey. So we have something called our quarterly impact uh, equity impact report um, in that we share honestly where we're at. Um, so we share things around um, such as compensation and benefits, right? When we talk about um, getting folks on a livable wage for nonprofits, especially with limited resources, what does that look like? What are those hard um, conversations and hard decisions that you have to make to get to that point? Um, so really, again, hoping to be a model for what this process can look like for the rest of the sector and share um, really transparently what that can look like for folks. So when we started to look um, at what kind of resources we would develop externally for the sector, we wanted to understand what folks were experiencing. And so of course we turned to data. As I mentioned earlier, um, we have, we ourselves do a lot of research for the sector. And that comes in the form of, um, we do compensation and benefits reports every three to four years where we look at how much are people being paid? Um, what are the differences in terms of um, identities and demographics that people are being paid? We also do a state of the sector report as well as other things. So based on the data that we were collecting, we could already kind of start to assess of, of some of the issues that the nonprofit sector workforce was experiencing. And so the first is obviously sector leadership is overwhelmingly white. And you're going to see in a little bit um, even more so than the national number. So 87% of CEOs were white and 81% of board members were white. Um, and we do know that the representation of um, black and brown individuals specifically um, becomes bigger as you start getting into actual service delivery. So when you look at the folks that have the boots on the ground, the program managers, the social workers, that becomes higher numbers of, of BIPOC individuals. And then you also see some uh, discrepancies uh, when you start laying other identities and inter intersectionality, such as gender. So we saw that even though the sector is overwhelmingly female, 78% um, identify as female, the majority of board members are, C are males, and there's a pay discrepancy and a pay gap amongst male CEOs and female CEOs, which is really kind of mind boggling when you think about an, an entire industry that is very overwhelmingly female led, there still exists a pay discrepancy when you look at the majority of the board members and really it's the board that sets the pay for um, CEOs and the staff, it still continues to perpetuate um, that pay gap. And then we did see that even though the majority of organizations have a non-discrimination policy, um, it wasn't all inclusive of people's identities. So when you looked at um, gender identity and expression or sexual orientation, those were um, less prevalent in non-discrimination policies. And then we did also see that 39% of jobs pay less than $15 an hour, um, which this is a couple of years old. We are in the middle right now of doing a, a newer compensation and benefits survey, um, but uh, we know that it isn't changing fast enough, right? And even though now we've had the, um, the minimum wage in Florida go up, um, we do know, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the folks that are making those wages are um, BIPOC individuals, right? And so even though 
as you get higher into the hierarchy of organizations that way those wages look better the predominant of folks that are are making the the least amount are the um black and brown individuals any question around this this local data before i move on to the national is that for jacksonville specifically or for all of florida it's all for northeast florida so when we talk about so when we talk about Northeast Florida, that's Baker, Clay, Nassau, Duval, St. John's, and Putnam. Yeah. And so we we see that national data isn't much better. Um, so 70% uh, of organizations are led by white CEOs and only 13% of CEOs identify as Black or African American. So um, and that's uh, research from Candid that is very new. Um, and so Jacksonville, as you can see in the previous slide, is 17% um, more more representation of white leadership and nonprofits than even the, the national um, data. And we know demographically Jacksonville tends to be a really great snapshot of the country as a whole. Um, and then we also know that nonprofits that serve people of color or are led by people of color do have a harder time getting funds um, than other organizations, right? And and of course, this is data that we know from um, people's experiences, but now we're really starting to see the numbers that can really back up and, and help round out um, the picture of what's what's happening in the nonprofit sector. Um, and then there's a really great organization called Race to Lead that I, if anyone's interested in in kind of um, the issues of equality within the nonprofit sector, I highly recommend um, you check them out. But they did a, a survey around um, women of color in the nonprofit sector, and they did report that they were passed over for promotions and um, job opportunities by others, including men of color and white women and white men um, who had comparable or even lower credentials, right? And so this isn't new, this isn't something that is shocking, but um, we are seeing more and more institutional institutions such as Candid, such as Chronicle of Philanthropy, really collecting data and adding it to um, all of the research that they're doing, which is promising in terms of um, getting resources and funds to really start addressing this. Any questions or thoughts on, on the national data? Okay, wonderful. So when we looked at um, all of that and we were ready to um, start developing those resources, um, it it really led us to the point of addressing the fact that we were in a new political landscape. As I mentioned, the landscape of 2020 is was very different than the landscape we are now, right? Um, legislation such as the Stop Woke Act and, and all those things really made it complicated and hard for organizations to... Um, engage in DEI trainings. Um, and so we had already seen that happening, right? All of the re trainings that we had, even if they weren't explicitly, you know, labeled as DEI or anything, even if they had any semblance of equity, we were seeing much um, lower numbers and we were seeing higher flake rates. So people would register, but then they wouldn't attend. Um, and so we really had an honest conversation about, you um, how we wanted to approach this and we engaged a lot of our partners so we work really closely with 904 and we work really closely with other um, kind of local um, equity consultants and we had conversations about um, what our goal was and um, we, we had a, a really great conversation where we talked about like do we want to be right or do we want to help people and we really felt like we had an opportunity to create resources and um, services that could make a tangible impact in people's lives, especially in the nonprofit um, workforce, who we know is integral into a lot of systems, right? When we talk about youth, when we talk about healthcare, when we talk about, um, uh, you know, 
crime reform like those are all um really buoyed by the nonprofit sector and so um we started talking about moving the discourse and the way that we were structuring our resources away from the mo- emotional case right of this is the right thing to do the moral debate more towards the business efficiency and the best practice case and there were a couple of reasons to that right so the first is the very blatant one of um you know this is a best practice when you when you talk about um uh you know organizational effectiveness risk mitigation employee retention these are all best practices um and that is all based on having equitable systems right kind of making the case that nobody benefits from having these oppressive systems and inequitable policies and protocols um but it's also served a kind of second purpose to kind of eliminate the 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 feeling that it was a debate still right because we felt the more that we were having that moral conversation the more that it made it seem that these kind of practices and this direction was still up for debate and we wanted to make it known that not only is it not up for debate but this is best practice and this is what we're doing um and this is how we're moving forward in developing all our resources through this lens and we're not unique to that the entire sector is both nonprofit and for-profit um there's tons of data out there to show that um, these kind of DEI um, policies are just best practice policies, and they serve a lot of different benefits, both from a moral standpoint, but also from a business efficiency standpoint. Um, and so we decided that our initial focus would be developing resources around equitable HR systems, um, and for a couple of reasons. So the first is, um, as I mentioned, um, we felt HR um was the kind of quickest most tangible way to start really impacting people's lives um and making a difference and, and making a dent in um how the nonprofit sector became more equitable right obviously we want to be um equitable in all we do but we felt really taking the approach that we took of getting your house in order and ensuring that before you talk about you know raising communities out of poverty are you raising even your own staff out of poverty, right? And so um, ensuring that the sector is not only having equitable resources for the community, but even just for our own workforce. Um, and the second kind of reason for it is that the, the nonprofit sector isn't unique or isolated from the current workforce crisis, right? We are have losing um, people left and right because we are unable to pay them living wages. We are losing people left and right because they are getting burnt out. There's no um, kind of um, sustainable systems in place to support them. And so we ho- we felt like by taking that um, HR approach initially, it was meeting the most pressing um, and tangible needs first. Any questions on this before I move on? I do have a question. So in the instance a nonprofit comes and wants to partner with you all, are you saying that uh, you're going to provide them the strategic plan to set up an HR system or are you going to like serve as an HR system? I'm sorry. So um, normally what we do is when we develop resources like this, we disseminate it in a couple ways. So first is through... Um, a series and summit. So we we do actual trainings and workshops where we'll, we'll bring in organizations and their HR departments or people or whoever in the organization is leading the HR um, and we'll train them on, on these things. Um, but then the second is in kind of just open source resources and um, tools. So making it available on our website and kind of trying to share it as far and wide as possible of um, these kind of tangible tools that you can take back to your organization. So really moving folks beyond the theoretical of, sure, I want to become more equitable. Sure, I want my staff to feel more supported. Sure, I you know don't want to have unfair recruitment practices, um, but I don't even know how, where to begin on that. So um, that's how we developed the Beyond Boundaries series and summit. Um, it's a series and summit that is actually launched this year. Um, and 
Um, it's a five session summit, and then it, it culminates in a in a half day summit where we really look at um, breaking down some of those core pieces that we feel tend to lead to inequitable systems, um, both racially and gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, so we looked at things such as compensation benefits and promotions, um, fair recruitment practices, so really teaching um, nonprofit sector professionals around implicit bias, explicit bias, um, things such as um, you know, combating um, bias against folks with criminal histories, criminal records. Um, we also looked at equity driven strategies for boards of directors. We know that a lot of the time um, nonprofit staff may be really behind um, addressing racial inequity in their organizations, but the board isn't always behind it. So really developing um, ways for the board to um, not only become trained around DEI and equity and inclusion, but um, embedded into their strategic planning. So it's embedded into the organization for years and years. Um, developing equitable partnerships. Um, we look at, um, oftentimes we have small organizations, especially um, grassroots um, community-based organizations that will come to us and say, we want to partner with so-and-so, but the power dynamics are so toxic. These large organizations hold all the power. So really training those larger organizations how to be um, good stewards and equitable stewards of, of the funds they're in resources and how to create more um, healthy relationships um, that are symbiotic with community-based organizations. And then um, leveraging advocacy as a tool. Um, so we've been talking a lot about advocacy lately. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the Stop Woke Act really um, both realistically and uh, my more um, cynical side, I think folks use it as a excuse to not do this work. So we've been working really hard to um, kind of make folks informed around what they can and can't do. And of course, as we know, the Stop Woke Act now is dead in the water. There's It was held up in court, so it's not even applicable. But again, really reinforcing for organizations um, that they should be um, agents for change and advocates. And so we talk about uh, political activity that is prohibited. So that political activity that's prohibited is predominantly around candidates. So we tell organizations as a 501c3, um, a, we are tax exempt, which means that we cannot endorse a candidate. We cannot um, uh, make uh, donations to candidates. We cannot publish um, literature or materials that are in favor of a candidate. Um, so basically any kind of, we can't use any of our resources to try to get someone elected. But what we can do is we can absolutely advocate for particular issues. So amendments um, or anything that's on the ballot that isn't candidate specific, um, we absolutely can. And so I think about um, Jacksonville Public Education Fund, JPEF, um, a few years back, the half cent tax was on the ballot and um, JPEF did a wonderful job of making materials, making marketing and language to really inform the community about how this would be a tangible benefit to improve Duval County schools and make really necessary infrastructure improvements to those schools. And so I, that's a really great example. There are tons of others of really um, um, successful advocacy of organizations um, that show that there is no limit to what an organization can do with engaging in advocacy as long as it's not engaging in um, influencing an election. And yeah, uh, Manis? See so you have your hand up. Okay, so Ma I think Manis, whenever you're ready, just come off mute if you want to ask a question. Yeah, yeah. sorry about that, sorry about that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sometime with this technology. My name is uh, Stanley Scott Man. Uh, that's my African name, Mansa Musa. Uh, one of the richest man that ever lived. My, uh, I hear what you're saying about the uh, nonprofit here, 
And I know a little bit about that uh, because I did a little research with Stanford University in 2016. We had the same problems during that time that we were having today. Now, when it comes to, I say, minority nonprofits, especially in the African American community, too many of them need, most of them need to join together. There's too many small ones. And when I say small, I'm talking about anywhere from a million dollars up to $20 million. And that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Because like you say, a lot of them are underfunded and the whole nine yards, just like a regular business. But when it comes to nonprofit, especially in Northeast Florida, there are too many. And a lot of time, if you're not a member of a certain club, you would not get the, the funding. Thank you. No, I absolutely. Um, and, you know, that's something that um, is really hard to address because um, you're absolutely right there. We have thousands of nonprofits in Northeast Florida, and the majority of them are doing amazing work um, and are, are the experts in their communities, but do just do not have the resources. And so we're seeing a lot of these amazing community leaders really getting burnt out, um, going bankrupt from running these organizations. And we just don't want to see that. Right. And so um, we've been really thinking through how do we start having those conversations about mergers um, in a way that is equitable, because we also know that while, yes, it'd be great if these organizations joined forces, a lot of the time, these larger organizations are not ready to approach that in a way that is equitable or fair or symbiotic, right? And so um, we we know that there's a lot of kind of trust building and a lot of honest conversations that need to happen um, in order for folks to feel okay and rightfully so to part with this nonprofit that has, you know, been their heart and soul and that they've poured themselves into. So um, totally agree with that. Any other any other thoughts? Okay, awesome. So, uh, and then just to wrap up the the legal activity, um, there are um, other um, kind of avenues for advocacy that I I think are a lot of organizations do not engage in, including influencing regulation. Regulation of uh, regulatory bodies are not um, legislative. And so they are kind of um, legally separated from other other bodies and institutions. So they're not even seen as lobbying. If an organization were to go to a, a regulatory body and say, hey, you know, the amount of money that you're allocating for this is too low or these working conditions are not right. Um, and so we kind of are always telling organizations to, if you're not at least um, engage in advoca um, advocacy with those regulatory bodies, you need to know who they are and the decisions they're making because these kind of re uh, or regulatory organizations that are working behind the scenes are setting all the rules for not only how we do our work, um, but um, uh, what we can even do. So, And then um, we also talk a lot about um, the 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 role that systemic impacts should play in designing your your advocacy platform so um we know that the work that organizations do with communities does not exist in a vacuum right so um i, I was talking with dennis earlier about an example is food insecurity or food deserts right we know that um, there are tons of organizations that are working to get people fed, and when they develop their advocacy platforms or they're thinking of, you know, what kind of stuff should we be looking at, oftentimes you get tunnel vision. You say, okay, food, feeding people, but you can't talk about, you know, food insecurity without talking about transportation, right? Um, I've, I've been to meetings uh, in Newtown where there were senior citizens talking about having to cross five lane highways to get to a Walmart because it was the closest thing, right? So you, you can't separate 
these identities and experiences. You can't separate someone's socioeconomic experience or identity from their gender identity, right? So we always tell folks to really take the time to think about a person as as a whole person and who they are when you're serving them, because there may be other aspects of their identity that are exacerbating um, the experiences and making it harder for you to serve them, right? When you think about um, homelessness and you think about someone being able to hold a job, um, you can't separate someone's race from that, right? You can't separate the often crazy systemic barriers and experiences that um, black and brown people exist uh, experience. Um, so really helping folks to understand that, again, it's not just about doing the right thing in the moral debate. It's about just efficiency, um, right? And nonprofits, for better or worse, the good parts and bad parts of them do want to um, be efficient, in, in what they're doing. Um, and then, of course, we always tell folks that understanding um, the, those systemic impacts will help you more better be connected to the constituents you're serving, right? There's nothing worse than um, getting services from an organization, and they're supposed to be representing your community, and you see them publicly taking a stance that is absolutely against what you and your community believe. So really helping folks understand that the more that you invest into understanding intersectionality um, and the different identities that people hold, the more connected you can be to those that you serve. Um, so yeah, uh, kind of want to open it up for discussion, questions. Um, yeah. And feel free to come off mute. Hello? Yes. Yes, yeah, Stanley Scott, uh, Master Musa, once again. We still are not addressing the, some of the main problems with nonprofits. They are not, well, I'm talking about in Jacksonville, Jacksonville, Florida. Mm -hmm. We have people that have been around 20, 30 years with nonprofits, and nothing has changed in this community especially when it it talks about race we we have some serious problem yeah we continue yeah. to talk about it well we can continue to talk about it but nothing changed nothing but money is being spent by the ruling class thank you no you're you're absolutely right um i and i think a lot of this is is hard because um we talk to a lot of funders to let them know like you know you, to your point you can't keep giving money to the same people over and over again right and these folks are not the ones that are in the community doing the work um and unfortunately um there's just deeply embedded um and and i, I don't think jacksonville is unique to this um i i think they're just deeply embedded um biases that stop people from building relationships with black and brown community-based organizations. And so um, I think one of the things that, that we can continue to do is to create space for those relationships to take place, um, right? Because the money is where the money is, right? Um, and so how do we help cut some of that red tape and how do we create more opportunity for folks to break into that circle that you're talking about. Yeah, please go on. Did you want to did you want to say something else? Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> I, I forgot to press the button. Uh, I understand what you're saying and what's taking place here because I deal with this on a national level. I just keep using Jacksonville as a reference because I'm I'm a native of Jacksonville, born and raised. But my concern here is not this leadership problem, whether you're talking about downtown, where you're talking about community, where you're talking about neighborhood, you have a leadership problem. Now, uh, it's not only in the African-American community. Now, when it comes to the pathology, yes, it's number one 
in the African American community, and there's a reason why. And it's because of leadership across the board. Thank you. Yeah. No, I I I think you're right. And I'm and you know, I I have my theories of um why that's that's happening both in terms of the the systems of power as well as in the community but I'd, I'd love to open it up for for other folks also if anyone has anything to add to that discussion I actually had a question really quickly. Um, I know we were talking about nonprofits, but does your organization like help other companies outside of nonprofits? Um, just asking that question because when you mentioned funding and how a lot of companies or organizations that are African American led tend to get less funding. Um, I'm I thought about my university that I went to. I'm originally from Pennsylvania and I went to a HBCU and we were a part of the state system. However, we didn't get the same funding mm -hmm. as a lot of the other schools. And so I was just wondering, is do you guys kind of integrate with other aspects outside of the nonprofit space? Not as not as much as we want to. Um, I would say um we're a pretty small team. So we have about seven folks on our team right now um i i will say from a funding perspective not always um universities and health systems tend to be their own monster of um regulatory bodies and, and funding and things like that what we do what we do offer um to other sectors including the for-profit sector um, is are the resources we offer. So when we think about, as I just highlighted, for example, the the Beyond Boundary series around HR, those are resources that we share widely, not just with the nonprofit sector, but for with the for profit sector as well. Um, as well as um, we have a resource around um, uh, like an LGBTQI plus um, inclusion guide, which we make available to. Um, for-profit as well as non-profit individuals. Um, one thing that we are doing for the first time ever um, with this new compensation and benefits um, survey is we are taking into account for-profit wages as well. Um, so as we kind of build out our um, narrative and, and kind of dissect the findings, we'll have for profit wages as well um to be able to see what are people being what are people being paid paid in in northeast florida overall and how does the nonprofit sector stack up um which will obviously be a resource for the non for the for profit sector as well to kind of have that data but um yeah it's it's hard with those larger institutions to really um be able to provide you know useful resources unfortunately Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Wonderful. So um, I'm going to put my information up. So this is my email and my number. Um, if anyone has any questions around anything having to do with the nonprofit sector or um, any of the resources or information, I, I mentioned before, um, please feel free to give me a call or or shoot me an email. Um, but it's been wonderful talking with you all tonight. I think I'm going to give you some time back unless anyone has any any last minute questions. Okay. If there's no last minute questions, I just want to take the last opportunity to thank you, Isis, for speaking on behalf of the nonprofit center. Um, of Northeast Florida on behalf of the Jacksonville Urban Center of Advocacy and Social Justice. And thank you to all of our participants who are, have joined us online for um, the live presentation, as well as our viewers who are joining or viewing outside of this live presentation. So with that, I want to wish everyone a great night. And we hope to see you at our next conversation that will be happening next Thursday, uh, next month on the first of Thursday.
Awesome. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Thank good you. night. Thank you.